Yesterday was a momentous memorial in my life. It was 50 years ago yesterday, the 17th of April, 1971, that I underwent the hands of the Presbytery and was ordained a minister. Actually, two weeks prior to this, and I didn't even think about it, on that day, the 4th of April, 1971, marked 50 years that I've been a pastor. I've never been without a church to serve for 50 years. I was called to be the pastor of the Antioch Primitive Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama on the 4th of April, 1971. I'd already been preaching a year as what they called a licentiate. I could go in the pulpit, I could preach, but I was not ordained. I could not serve the ordinances, baptize or administer communion. So it was two weeks later, or almost, that I was ordained to be able to perform every function of the gospel ministry. I was 19 years old. I was a kid. I had not as yet met the woman that I would marry. There was a man named Elder Jimmy Rogers that prayed the ordination prayer before hands were laid on me. It was one of the most powerful prayers I've ever heard in my life. I have a cassette tape recording of my ordination, and most of it you can't even understand. It is so old. But I can understand almost everything that Elder Rogers prayed on that day. As the hands were laid on me, I wept uncontrollably. It's on the tape. You can hear it. I know some people probably wondered if I would even get control of myself. Just what was being placed upon me descended over me with such power that for a while there I just lost it. You could hear me all over the auditorium weeping. And if I had known then what I know now, <laughs> I probably would have wept more <laughs> because I had no idea of what was ahead of me in the 50 years to come. It is a very weighty responsibility to be an ordained minister because according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, and I want to talk about this today, you're going to have to pardon an old man taking a journey down memory lane today. But in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul is speaking of himself and Timothy. Paul was an apostle, but Timothy was just an ordained elder, like I am. And yet, speaking in the plural, meaning that this would be true of my office, as well as the office of an apostle. We then, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. I am here in the stead of Jesus Christ, and I am here to beseech you, or God beseeches you, by me, so that it is an irrefutable fact that in this office I am a spokesman for God. I represent God to you when I'm teaching you in this pulpit. There are not words to express the magnitude, the gravity of occupying such an office as I do. Now my first seven years in the pastorate was basically learning how the job is not done. I was more of a figurehead. The deacons, particularly the millionaire deacon, ran the church. I wasn't even allowed to speak to an issue when we had a business meeting without recognizing someone else as a moderator. We had the Robert Rules of Order that we followed. And we were in an association, which is a non-scriptural organization of churches that wielded influence over them, whether they said they did or not. So in those seven years, I really got burned out on some things. The church would not discipline members as they ought. We had several that did not come to church at all when they could. They didn't come because they didn't want to, and nothing was done about it. And I came here determined, God help me, I would never again go where I was there. I would have my problems, but it wouldn't be some of those. Now, I can honestly sit before you today, and by the way, I celebrated yesterday with a horrible toothache. <laughs> Had I known that, I would have cried more as well. <laughs> so I'm feeling kind of weak today. That's why I'm sitting down. 
But I can honestly say that I served those people with as much dedication and love as I have served you. I have some beautiful memories, despite the problems, of serving some of God's children in that place. Beautiful memories. The first person I ever baptized was named Gladys Keenum. I loved her dearly. She had actually gone to nursing school with Conrad Gerald's mother. Conrad knew her. Her nickname was Cotton because she had very light blonde hair. And as I say, she and Mama Gerald went to nursing school together and Conrad's mother and his aunt Louise Cloudis came to her baptism. I remember that. And when I left that church, some of the people were angry with me. I know they were very hurt. They loved me dearly. I loved them. It was, it was a very hard thing to do. I grieved for two years over the loss of those people. And some of them were angry with me. We had a deacon that I had visited in the hospital and in his home many times. He had a terrible lung disease and he died in and around the time I resigned the pastorate. And he cut me out of his funeral and gave it to somebody else, almost like a stroke of vengeance to show me what he thought of the decision I made. I remember the millionaire deacon when I went to thank him for the things he had done for me and to say goodbye in a very rude and gruff way said, well, you say it's time to be a man, then grow up and be a man. And those were his parting words. That first woman I baptized, I think, got poisoned by a lot of gossip that went on after I left. And she was not thinking very kindly of me at that time. But as time rocked on and she saw the way things developed, she came to understand why I left that church. And one time when we were down in Alabama visiting with my parents, my mother went out and picked her up and brought her out so that we could spend some time with her and have lunch together. And when she got in the car to leave and I gave her a farewell hug, which was the last time I ever saw her, said she to me, you deserve every good thing coming your way. She died my friend. She died esteeming me and loving me and understanding why I did what I did. That is a precious memory that I treasure. The ministry that I have had here in Detroit was the ministry that God was preparing me for. He put me through seven years of learning how it's not done so that I might come here with a clearer understanding of how it ought to be done. Now, one of my jobs as a minister is to persuade men to believe and follow the truth. I'm going to give you two verses along that line to show you that this is what I'm, this is the business that I am to be about. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 8, speaking of Paul, it said he went boldly into the synagogue, or he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. There is that about this job that is argumentative. It is meant to be, and in the process, persuasion is to be accomplished. And then in chapter 28 and verse 23, speaking of Paul again, who is the pattern for all ministers of the gospel. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them and to persuade is to induce someone to believe something. Persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. So I am in the business of persuading men. Now I think that what I'm going to tell you now originated with Aristotle. I'm going to give you a quote from the Trivium by Mir Miriam Joseph when she was talking about the art of persuasion. She said, persuasion, and Miriam Joseph is the author of the book, The Trivium. She was a, a nun, a brilliant woman. She, the woman forgot more about grammar than I will ever know. I hope to God she is a child of God, because when I see her, I want to give her a hug. She said, persuasion is achieved by means of logos, pathos, and ethos. Now, logos is the argument. It's the proof the speaker advances that leads to the conclusion of truth. It's citing all the verses, all the proof texts, reasoning out of the scripture to come to the conclusion of truth, offering the proof. That's the Logos.
The ethos is the character of the speaker that inspires the hearer to have confidence in what is being advanced. Uh, just a couple of verses to show how important this is. We come to 1 Thessalonians 1.5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. See, the manner of life, the ethos, is important. And then in 1 Thessalonians 2, 10 and 11, Paul could write to the Thessalonians and say, Your witnesses and God also. And if I'm worth my salt, I need to be able to say the same to you. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. So there's the ethos. The, I mean, if I was a liar, a shoplifter, an adulterer, would you put confidence in what I teach you? Obviously not. But then comes pathos. And pathos is where we appeal to the emotion of our hearers, putting them in a frame of mind to receive what is advanced. We put some feeling and some passion into what we say to reach you on an emotional level. And in short, in preaching and in engaging in the act of persuasion, I have to prove it, I have to live it, and I have to feel it. I have to prove it, I have to live it, and I have to feel it. Now, the problem with the pathos is that sometimes when I'm waxing warm and emotional, that's when I will tend to make my mistakes in either overstating something or either incorrectly reporting something after I'm done. I think, well, you know, that's not quite the way it was. I was remembering it incorrectly. Or that's when I will generally cite the wrong reference, when I'm waxing bold in pathos. And I do that, and I'm supposed to do that. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, 19 and 20, And for me, pray for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And when you are speaking boldly, boldness requires a certain amount of pathos, of passion when you're speaking. And I think that's why we read in Acts 13 and verse 46, Acts 13, 46, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. I mean, they really started to get fired up, you see. The passion was waxing warm and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, you ju and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So there's the logos, the ethos, and the pathos. And I've had people tell me over the years, they like the fact that I have some passion when I preach, that it is not just dry discourse. But when I am waxing bold at such a time, you can be assured I am not concerning myself with how you feel about what I'm saying. I'm just consumed with speaking the truth and getting it out there. And when I wax bold, especially in rebuke, I often experience what the Apostle Paul experienced when he rebuked the Corinthians in the first epistle. And he said in 2 Corinthians 7, 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. In other words, I had second thoughts about what I said. And, and I've done the same things many, many times. I've gone over something I said that I knew after I said it was likely going to hurt somebody. And then rethink and think, should I have said that? Or should I have said it that way? Or should I have toned it down? Or should I have qualified it? I often go over it like that. And Paul did too. He said, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. See, people, if you do not always like what you hear me say, 
or the way I say it. Bear in mind, I do not always like it either when I reflect back on it. But you must always ask yourself this. If you don't like what I said, and you don't like the way I said it, or maybe you don't like the, the plague, the platter that it was served up on, you always has to have to ask yourself, is it the truth, even if it didn't suit my taste? Did he tell the truth? And if I did, then there it is. And you see, once the reproof is administered, here's what has happened. It is in the person's mind now. It may sting him today. He may even hate me today. But one day, it may spark a conviction that will lead him to the truth. Because now that I haven't smoothed it over or swept it under the rug, but put it right out there in front, now they have to decide, what do I think about that? Do I believe that? Is he right? Is he wrong? The seed has been planted. And how you receive my sermons, and this is a fact, greatly depends on the frame of mind you're in when you hear them. If you're in a nasty frame of mind, then you'll likely find something to take issue with. But if you're in a more jubilant or open frame of mind, you'll accept it differently. We all know that we perceive things differently depending on the mood we're in on a given day. If you don't know that about yourself, start paying attention. It's true of all of us. Your spouse might say something to you today that you take great issue with that tomorrow it would just go right over your head. And how you receive my sermons, I cannot be responsible for that. I just have to preach the best way I can. Because if I concern myself too much with how you're going to take what I say, it will cramp me and I will not be able to preach effectively. Amen. Now this morning I thought of something. And I'm actually going to take time that I had not intended to take to read something to you. It's from the distant past. And I think this emphasizes how my ministry has been one of logos, ethos, and pathos. This particular thing I'm going to read to you was written by Jim and Dee's son, Mark Ruma, many years ago when he was in college taking speech 101. It's a speaker evaluation. And it was this young man's evaluation of me as a speaker. I will warn you at the outset, it is very complimentary. And so, it's going to sound rather self-serving for me to read it. But I can honestly say to you that I am humbled by it. Though I am very honored that I would have made this impression on a young man leaving me with a longing wish he had followed the faith that I had taught him. If I could baptize Jim and Dee's two sons and your boy, I'd think I had died and gone to heaven. And you'd think the same. And so, if you think me a fool in reading this, I'm going to say as Paul, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little, excepting in this case, the boast comes from Mark Ruma. It's a, it, it illustrates this thing about the pathos preeminently. He says, let me begin my critique. This is a speaker critique. He's critiquing me. Let me begin my critique by telling you a little bit about the speaker. He began his ministry 20 years ago in the southern part of Alabama. I began my ministry in 1971. Then this would have been written around 1991, I want to think. He began his ministry 20 years ago in the southern part of Alabama. He is a brilliant man. Well, that's arguable. And a master of technique and individuality. That is not arguable. <laughs> I never really thought of him as being a public speaker, but always just looked upon him as a pastor or teacher. He is a relatively normal-sized person with dark black hair and a neatly trimmed charcoal-colored beard. This was many years ago. His appearance is, appearance is quite pleasant. And he wears tailored suits, not robes or strange religious garments. He preaches to a group of people known as the Detroit Church, 
We are believers in God, and Sunday is the day that we earnestly and eagerly await. The audience, in other words, is very excited to hear what is about to be said. This is your Uncle Mark, kids. This is your Uncle Mark talking now. Obviously, the speaker is a minister, and now that his personal appearance and a little life background have been addressed, let us look at two of his speaking qualities, verbal and nonverbal expression. Before we go on, it is important to realize that even though the members of the audience want to listen to what is preached, most of us have had a busy week, and Sunday morning is the only time we really have a chance to relax. On Sunday, people want to hear music and feel spiritual and close to their God. It takes a certain charisma and energy to cause people to feel this way. Outward verbal communication is the basis of his speaking ability. After all, this is the main channel of communication. He is skillful with his words and takes time to enunciate each word with clarity. In times of excitement, his voice, pitch, and rate all quicken and are prompted by the words, hold your seats now, here it is, with the statement or point following immediately thereafter. His voice carries very well and with extreme clarity. Even by just listening to him, one can feel closer to God. In times of great remorse or sincerity, the quietness or reverence of his pitch together with a slow rate cause you to wonder and ponder the words that he speaks. It is this masterful ability and variety that lets him speak with great conviction and which has turned him into the respected minister he is today. His verbal communication skills are to be envied, but his nonverbal talents add emphasis and a mechanical twist to his teaching. His wide variety of hand gestures physically trace his main points. They not only carry the message along, but they animate the message and entertain the audience. His facial expressions range from, range from smiling outward laugh to a reverent admonition of warning to sadness of weeping tears. He is not afraid to step out in front of the pulpit and walk around talking to individuals, making the sermon more personal. He seems to be having a good time when he is preaching, and this allows the audience to relax and listen without difficulty. Pastor Ben J. Mott combines his verbal and nonverbal skills simultaneously to attain his goals and present his message in the clearest and most concise way. Church is not always the funnest place to be, even though it should be, and we should all want to get closer to our God, it is not always that way. I believe he understands this and makes learning about God interesting and fulfilling. His charisma and ability to move the audience emotionally all contribute to getting his main objectives accomplished. Pastor Mott is one of the best public speakers I've ever listened to. His pleasant appearance, his scriptural knowledge, there comes the logos, and credibility, there's the ethos, reinforce his ministry and present him to be a very intelligent and God-fearing pastor. The people of our church hold great respect for him and so do I. He is a man with strong beliefs and morals, speaking, preaching, teaching, or entertaining. He gets his message across and the funny thing is it is all happening in church. And he talked about how in hearing the teaching it caused one to feel closer to God. Well, if a minister is a spokesman for God, don't you think that's what should be happening? Is that you come into a nearer awareness of God and an experience with God? You can best know I value that. And Jim's wiping the tears as well you should. Now, one of the things that's difficult about this job come, emerges from 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. The word in sample is 
a synonym with the word example. It's the same word with two different spellings. I am to be an example to you people to follow. And yet at the same time, I struggle with the same things you do. I'm just as human and just as much a sinner as you are. The Apostle Paul one time when some people wanted to worship him, he and Barnabas ran out into the crowd and said to them in Acts 14, 15, when they wanted to do sacrifice to them, he said, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you. The Apostle Paul could say of himself, and I can say the same in Romans 7 and verse 8, the law hath wrought in me. Or he said, but sin taking occasion by the commandment, Romans 7, 8, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, all manner of evil desire. I struggle with the same things you do, same kinds of weaknesses you do. In fact, maybe more so, because Satan knows if he can bring down the man of God, it's an easy step to bring you down with him. And in order to be an example, I have to be successful in this struggle with sin and Satan. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You see, in this battle with sin and Satan, although I will have my setbacks as all do, I cannot lose this battle or I lose my right to this office. But again, you will see and must see that at the end of the day, I'm only a man like you are. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels and that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And one of the greatest agonies, and I do mean agonies, of this job is having to live with my own imperfections and flawed judgments and yet try to be an example to you to follow. I am humbled by the thought that the last miracle of Christ's healing was healing a wound inflicted by an overzealous preacher. And I know, I'm sure, I have inflicted such wounds myself. It was Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Peter chopped off his ear with his sword in a fit of zeal to defend his Lord in John 18, 10. And Jesus, we read in Luke 22, 50 and 51, put the man's ear back and healed it. The last miracle of healing, a wound inflicted by an overzealous servant of God. I am humbled by that, but take comfort in it as well. I have told you this before, and I tell you again, that the most difficult part of this job is having to make judgment calls, such as when I decided to shut the assemblies down a year ago this month. You may not always like my judgment calls, but you have to live with them, which makes it all the more difficult for me. You had to live with the decision I made I took away from you the opportunity to come here for one month. I took that away from you, and I had to live with that. But always remember, I have to live with those decisions myself, just as you do. If I ever decide not to serve communion, not only have I deprived you, but I have deprived myself. Now, you may think some of my judgments are too strict, or you may think some of them are not strict enough. You may think that there are things that I should prosecute in this church that I do not, or things that I prosecute that I should leave alone. You may think that, but at the end of the day, it's my job to make those calls. But understand this, that if you think I err in the way I lead this church, and if you think I'm taking them in a the wrong direction, the court of this church is open to you to prosecute me. And that happened once and that is still open to you to prosecute me and to have me put out of this job if you think I am not conducting it worthily. And then you can prosecute whomever you think should be prosecuted 
where you think I failed to do what you think ought to be done. But in all of this, I seek refuge in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. But with me, it is a very small thing. Did you notice that? Not only a small thing, but a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. I've preached sermons that I thought were duds and I've gotten such positive feedback that I've realized I'm not an adequate judge. And then I've thought, I've preached some that were masterpieces and nobody said a thing. So, yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing but my, by myself, yet I'm not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. It is a very small thing if your judgment of me, something I say or something I do is negative. And this is not to say that I cannot receive criticism because I know full well I can and have received constructive criticism. But at the end of the day when a criticism is administered, I have to decide whether I think it is deserved or not. And in the end it is the Lord that will render the final verdict. And, equally true, it is a very small thing if your judgment of me is positive. Because you see, I look back and think that there's every possibility that your judgment is blinded by your love and loyalty to me. So again, even if your judgment is positive, at the end of the day the Lord will render the final verdict. And this is why when I decided to shut down the assemblies, I wrote these words to you. You may try to assure me a thousand times over that I'm doing the right thing. And several did try to reassure me of that. You may try to assure me a thousand times over that I'm doing the right thing and that God is not going to judge me for this. But this will be God's to decide, not yours. I throw myself on His mercy. Now you must understand that in rendering judgment, which I am called to do, I am an overseer. I am generally the, I am the one that oversees church discipline when the church is called upon to render judgment. That whenever I do that, I am under a strict commandment in Deuteronomy 16 as a judge in the congregation. And in fact, any time you are called upon to sit in judgment, you are equally under this obligation. In Deuteronomy 16, 18 through 20, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift, for the gift doth blind the eyes of the wise, I can never let the money in that box ever influence anything I do in this pulpit. The day I start to do that, I'm a dead man. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. That which is altogether just shalt thou follow that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. I must follow that which is altogether just. The word altogether means everything being included. In all respects and every particular entirely, wholly, totally, quite. And I cannot show partiality in judgment. I have this commandment given from 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 4 and verse 21. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 21. I noticed I wrote the wrong reference. I could have corrected it later, but a closure freak has to correct it now. Excuse me. 1 Timothy 4.21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. That is verse 21 of 1 Timothy 4. 
five. I'm sorry. Yep, I had it four. I had it, I had it wrong. I'm sorry. Thank you very, very much. See, I have this treasure in earthen vessels. You just got reminded of that. And I wasn't even all that, well, was I that passionate? I don't know. Anyway, it happened. But I'm to show no partiality. I can't go over here and demonize one thing when maybe a like thing is happening over here and I'm overlooking that. If I'm going to demonize this and there's something similar over here in that, I got to demonize that too. I got to look at it all. I can do nothing by partiality. And in rendering judgment, and this is critical, in 1 Timothy 1.19, but this is also subjective and I will be the first to admit it. In 1, Corinthians, 1 Timothy, sorry, 1 Timothy 1.19, 119, I am commanded that in order to war a good warfare, it is necessary that I be holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwrecked. I have to hold not only faith, but a good conscience. I have to be able to sleep with me at night, put my pillow on my head at night, and have a good conscience about things I've done and things I've decided. However, even this can be a struggle. As I told you, when I decided to lock the church down for a month. In this particular case, it was not a question of doubt versus no doubt. It was a question of more doubt versus less doubt. It was a gray area if ever there was one. And I just had to select the path of action in which I had the less doubt. Thus I did, to try to maintain a good conscience. I cannot judge something if he is evil if I'm not persuaded in my own conscience that it is. I have to sell something to myself before I can sell it to you. And there are just some things that are bigger than I am. There's just some things that I can't bring myself to render a judgment. And so I always come back to 1 Corinthians 4, 5, a verse that a preacher taught me to rely on heavily one that Mary Dell knew, we knew. Jim and Dee, you remember him, Elder Norman Cooper. He taught me, I learned a lot, I didn't know him long, but I learned a great deal from him in the time that I knew him. And this is one thing that he taught. In 1 Corinthians 4, 5, therefore judge nothing before the time come. Now that has to be qualified because there are some things we are told to judge. But sometimes there are things that we just can't arrive to a conclusive judgment about. And when that is the case, then we must withhold judgment. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Two things may be understood from that verse. First of all, all things will be balanced and come to light and leveled out at the second coming. We understand that. But even now in this world, the Lord makes visits to his church in which he makes bare his arm and brings things to light that otherwise would be hidden. I have seen him do it. So sometimes you just have to put it in the hands of Almighty God and let him deal with it. And trust me, in 50 years I have learned he is quite capable. He has done it many times. And I can take solace in that and leave it with him. And here's the thing. If you cannot live with my judgments, then you need to get another pastor. There are some things that I cannot make, and, and, and also there are some things I cannot make my peace with and maintain a good conscience. John and Kathleen will remember when I first went out to Las Vegas to start the evangelistic work there. I made everybody that worked in the casinos, no matter what they did, quit their jobs to join the church. That was where I was at that time. That's where my conscience was at that time. I invoked this verse and they did it. The more I went out there, the more familiar I became with the situation, I was able to relax that. I would not allow them to work as cocktail waitresses or dancers on a stage. I did not allow them to work at the gambling tables. But 
I would allow them to work maybe as a, in the restaurant or work as a, as a, I think we had one lady that worked at the switchboard or people that did repairs for the hotel rooms and things like that or maybe a bellhop or something like that. I did allow things like that later on. But it was, an evolu it was an evolution and dealing with a situation that I'd never dealt with in my life. I mean, Stuart Crane went out there and witnessed to these people, got a very rave response, came back and said, I don't know what to do with this, and dumped it in my lap. <laughs> I called Conrad to get advice. He said, I'm glad it's you, not I. <laughs> Thanks, Conrad. Well, he ended up with it anyway. <laughs> So there I was with that thing dumped in what do I'm going I'm going to 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 do an evangelistic work in Sin City. And it was one of the most successful I ever did in my life. I baptized 26 people in one week, 23 at one time. I've never repeated that. The church, the, the, you, you, I remember coming back and reporting what I did, and you could hear from the congregation that it's just like their jaws dropped in amazement that something like that had happened. And so I make conscience judgments. I don't want men wearing ear piercings, and I don't want members getting tattoos. I don't want women wearing blue jeans, unless perhaps it's a very feminine, fashionable de denim. I might make an exception there. I want the women to wear hair long enough, and men wear hair short enough, that there's no blending of the two. There is a clear distinction. These are judgment calls. I have to do these things to make peace with my own conscience even if I cannot always give up a solid reason, I still have to live with me. And again, if you don't like those judgments, then get another pastor. In fact, I was in the gym the other day and a man was surprised because I go in the morning when a lot of retired people go and he was surprised to find I wasn't retired. But no, I am not. And not making plans anytime soon. So now I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 3 which really sums it up how I've been able to continue and maintain and have the success, if you want to allow that word to be used, that I've had over these 50 years as a minister. Though right now, to be honest, I face a very sad situation. For years, I have watched this church increase in number. I watched that in the first Mm, let me see, first uh, 12 years of my ministry here. And then we had a major division in 1990. We lost a third of our members inside of a year. So I watched the church shrink down. Then I watched it slowly begin to grow back. Then we moved over here. The people from Canada started coming and our church grew to a size larger than it had ever been in its history. For a number of years now, we've had over 100 members. We now, for the first time in many years, this includes our non-resident members, our Canadian members, less, number less than 100. I look out over this congregation today, I see blank spaces that I didn't see for years. And I'm seeing them today. I'm watching my ministry shrink. I'm seeing it fractured and divided. And if you don't think that isn't tough to bear, you better think again. To have people that I love as much as I love anybody sitting in this room and yearn to face-to-face -to -face minister to, my own children included. This is a grievous trial to bear. But what is my choice? Give up? I search my heart to see if perchance there's something here that God is judging us for. So far I haven't been able to light on it. So I just have to keep plowing ahead doing what I'm doing and just trusting the Lord and waiting on the Lord. In fact, one thing that comforted me greatly, I'll go ahead and read it to you now, that comforted me so greatly, when I was still a very young preacher pastoring down south, I came upon a book, Lectures to My Students, by Charles Spurgeon, a favorite book of mine, one every pastor should have. And I remember, even a young preacher, I had gone far enough and tasted enough of the sorrow and grief that can come with this job and the burden of this job that I wept as I read this. There was one chapter on the minister's fainting fits and oh, could I relate to what he was saying and still can. But he made this statement to pastors. Continue with double earnestness to serve your Lord when no visible result is before you. Any simpleton can follow the narrow path in the light. 
Faith's rare wisdom enables us to march on in dark with infallible accuracy since she places her hand in that of her great guide. As to what happens in that border in the future, what happens with all of this coronavirus and all this stuff that's going on, I don't know what's coming. You don't know what's coming. We don't know what's coming. Our Canadian brethren don't know what's coming. There's a darkness ahead of us. And I just say, put your hand in the hand of one for whom darkness and light are alike. And do not let anybody prognosticate for you what shall happen tomorrow. None of us knows. And don't get yourself all worked up in depression because you came across some website that said this, this, this is going to happen. You don't know. They don't know. Only God knows. And put your hand in the hand of the infallible guide and let him walk us through this to a better day. But I read this verse, so important, in Ephesians 3, 7, whereof... And he just mentioned the word gospel. So the antecedent to that whereof is gospel. Whereof, that is of the gospel. I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. I appreciate that first person pronouns are used there. So I shall make that verse apply to myself. Paul is my pattern. And inasmuch as he is my pattern, I may apply those words to myself. I want you to notice the verb expression, I was made, is in the passive voice. In the passive voice, the subject receives the action of the verb make. I didn't do the making. I received the making. I did not make myself a minister. I was made a minister. I was born to be a minister. I was chosen by God to be what I am. 2 Corinthians 3, 5 and 6, Paul said, and remember these words, for I shall have reason to come back to them. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. This isn't of me, folks. I don't have the sufficiency for this to be of me. But our sufficiency is of God who, has, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. It is God that has made me a minister. And I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me. I was made a minister consistent with the particular gift God gave to me. You see, the ministry of the gospel, being a pastor and a teacher such as I am, is a gift that God gives to the church. This is evident in the next chapter, Ephesians 4, 7 and following but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all things, that he might fill all things. And remember, as he ascends, he gives gifts unto me. And so from his throne ascended to his glory, Jesus Christ reached into his bag of presents and handed a gift down to one so unworthy as I. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. That's my gift. I want you to know a ministry is not a man's to make. It is God's to give. And every minister has uniqueness about his ministry, ideally suited to those to whom he is called of God to minister. There are certain areas of expertise when it comes to scientific matters. For example, I shall give you sufficient to make an adequate case for the creation account of the Bible and the account of the Noah's flood, but I shall not give you proficient. I don't have a scientific brain that works that way. I have a language brain. I can break down the language for you. That I can do with skill. That's my gift. That's my gift. And the ministry of the gospel, notice this, this verse is so summary of what I want to set forth. It's a gift of the grace of God. Grace 
is a favor bestowed upon one who does not deserve it. It has been, it has been defined as undeserved favor, unmerited favor. I am not a minister because I deserve to be. I am a minister by the grace of God and left just as you all are when I've been preaching these sermons on Wednesday night about what Jesus did for us on that cross and everybody is almost speechless. It takes a while for the conversation to get going because everybody is so dumbfounded that God would do this for such as we. That's the way I feel about being a minister. I have said when I get to heaven I want to have a talk with the Lord. Why me? When I think there are other men so far more worthy to occupy this place than I. In and you say, well, you do a good job of it. By the grace of God, with a gift that God gave, I did not manufacture. So he gets the glory, people. As Paul could write in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10, for I'm the least of the apostles and I'm the least of the pastors, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle. I don't deserve to be called a pastor. He said, because I persecuted the church of God. I don't remember doing that, but I've done as bad but by the grace of God I am what I am. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. It all traces back to grace. I have never and will never earn the right to be what I am. But then, how does God make a minister? There's two things involved here. First of all, he makes a man a minister of the gospel by giving him the ability. I have to be able to speak. I have to be able to verbalize. I need a certain degree of eloquence. That's a gift. God makes a minister of the gospel by giving him the ability, and I have to have the mind. I have to be able to think logically, to reason, to put things together, to study, to learn, to understand language and communication. How can I possibly communicate the words of God if I don't know how to deal with words? It's an ability. It's an ability that God giveth. And with that, he gives the authority. In 1 Peter chapter 4, let me prove what I just said. The gift entails of ability and authority. In 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If you're going to get up here and speak, speak with the Bible. And if any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. See, notice where it came from with this end in view, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. 1 Timothy 1, 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me. See where the ability comes from? for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. So the gift involves being given the ability, but also the authority to do what I do. That's what the laying on of hands does. It confers upon me the authority. God confers it through that means. Mark chapter 13 and verse 34. 13, 34. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey. He ascended into heaven and gave gifts unto men. That's the far journey. Who left his house, that's his church, and gave authority to his servants. There are his apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. He gave me this authority. And that he also, another verse to underscore this, I'll give you two verses on each point, ability and authority. And this is Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. And an overseer is a supervisor, a man that has authority over the workmen to feed the church of God. And the word feed carries the idea of rule. Feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now God gives me the gift. He gives me the ability and he gives me the authority and it all comes by grace. And yet Paul said, having received that grace, he said, I did not receive it in vain, but I labored.
God gives me the ability, but I will have received that in vain if I don't take the ability God gave me and improve on it and develop it and utilize it. I will have received the gift of authority in vain if I sit here and become passive and let somebody else take it over and run it. And there are people that will do it if you let them. That's why we're told to take the oversight. Just get up there and do it. And if they don't like it, then they can get another preacher. Because I can only oversee you if you will submit. If you refuse to submit, then I've done my job. But to show you my responsibility to develop and utilize the gift, I come to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 12 through 4, 15. 4, 12 through 15. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example, we've covered that already, of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading. I read, 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 read. To exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. I think these things through and through and through. Give thyself wholly to them. I didn't even take a vacation last year. Where was there to go? <laughs> that thy profiting may appear before all. I am supposed to develop this gift in such a way that it's obvious to you I do it. In 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. What I do, people, is work. I work at this job. Hours and hours of studying and digging out of this book, looking up meanings of words. Not a day goes by, but what I don't appear in a dictionary. Of course, being a language student gives me occasion to do that also. Reading commentaries. Study, just study. To show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Why? Because I've done my job. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And then lastly, 2 Timothy 4, 5. But watch thou in all things endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. It is God's to give me the ability and authority. It is my responsibility to develop and utilize that gift and authority. And I work very hard to see that you are fed. Some of you men in this congregation that I have asked from time to time to fill this pulpit, I am not afraid but what you will testify that it is work to do what I do. It's easier as I go further, because I've learned more, but it's still work. Because you see, I still have to keep digging. I still have to keep learning. The day I quit learning deeper, new things is the day I become stale. I've seen it happen to ministers where they get lazy. They get distracted and they rely on study in the past. And I've seen them grow stagnant doing that. That would happen to me. I've heard ministers that if they were like broken records. If you heard them one time, you heard everything they had to say. I've seen some like that at the pastor's conference. The minute they get up there, you know what you're going to hear. It's going to be the same identical thing that you heard the year before and the year before that. How many of you attended churches that if it wasn't for John 3.16 and the Great Commission, you would have heard no preaching at all? Because that's all they said. Over and over and over. I saw that in the primitive Baptist and determined, God be my helper. I would not do that to people that pay the time and the energy to come sit at my feet and learn from me. In fact, if anything, I probably overdo it. I have some people practically begging, please preach us some of the basic stuff again. <laughs> please give me the simple stuff again. And I do try to do that. In Matthew 13, 52, then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. See, that's my job as an householder, to 
to bring forth things old, things you're familiar with, and things new. And it was so in my former pastorate. I worked hard to preach challenging and in-depth sermons. The former governor of Alabama, Guy Hunt, was a primitive Baptist preacher that invited me to come to his church. And his reason was this, your sermons are meaty. Carrie Holcomb was a member of the church at Eastlake where Conrad was joined and was ordained. Mary Dell and I knew her very, very well. She is a person enshrined in my memory. And I remember she paid to me one time one of the best compliments I've ever been paid. They, she and Morgan had taken me to Guy Hunt's church. I, do, I think it was Gump. I don't even remember what the name of it was. I don't want to venture it. But anyway, I preached there and we got in the car and Carrie Holcomb said this. God bless her memory. In her, in her Alabama brogue. You study. It's obvious. It's supposed to be that thy profiting may appear before all. Thank you, dear, dear Carrie Holcomb, for that encouragement. But also notice, as I must hasten to conclude, in Ephesians chapter 3, this is so very important. In verse 7, we're back there. Whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me, watch it now, by the effectual working of His power. The word effectual means it produces its intended effect or adequately answers its purpose. Now what is the purpose for this power of God working in this ministry? What's the purpose for this gift? And why and, and what is the effectual working of His power working to accomplish. It's stated right there in Ephesians 4. Look at the reason he gave me to you. Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. That's to bring you to make a better Christian out of you. To stimulate your growth. For the work of the ministry. To minister the gospel of God. The word of God. For the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith. So we're all believing the same thing. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, we're united in what we know about Jesus. Unto a perfect man, there's your growth. Under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. My job will never be done until you are as fully mature as Jesus Christ Himself, which means I'll always have a job. <laughs> that we henceforth should be no more tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men in cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait on the internet to deceive. The internet has become a cyclone of every wind of doctrine to pick up God's children and blow them this way and blow them that way. I inserted those words on purpose. But speaking the truth in love may grow. I can't give you life. That's not my job. God does that. I help you grow with the life God gave you. Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. You see, we are all joined in one body. And you become part of this when you're baptized and added to the church. And this is why we say when a person is baptized, they join the church. Because joints are things that are joined to other things. And that's, by the way, what that word compacted means as well. This verse is dripping with the idea of somebody joining the church and becoming a member of the church. This is where Christianity is practiced. This is where Christianity is developed. Anybody that thinks you can be a Christian without church is sadly deceived. Look at how much of the New Testament was written to a church or to churches. For God's sake, the last book of the Bible was addressed to seven churches. And this was what was so pitifully, pitifully, pitifully missing. And I grieve yet, grieve yet, from Greg Oldie's funeral, that for all the accolades handed, there were his church life, where his Christianity was nurtured and developed, was skated right over without mention. I chide myself, thinking maybe I should have just forced my way through. But that wasn't where I was at that time. 
though I look back now with regret that that was so sadly missing when I know he wanted that could you imagine me preaching John and Kathleen's funeral whichever one comes first depending on which one kills the other first <laughs> Could you imagine me preaching either John or Kathleen's funeral and talking about what a good cook she was? And we'll, we'll, we'll put you in the casket, Kathleen. What a good <laughs> cook she was and how she kept a beautiful yard and she was a good mother and she homeschooled her children and she had a good personality and never mention anything about her church life? What a void! What a vacuum! I mean, this is what defines her as a Christian. That's why those other things were complement, were, were, were effects of that. From whom the whole body joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. It's all about us growing together in the body of Christ as a church. That's what I'm to affect. Paul put it this way in Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Whom we preach, talking about Jesus, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Why? That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The word translated perfect there is the same word full age in Hebrews 5, 14. The objective of this ministry is the full maturity of the hearers. But notice what he said, whereunto I also labor. I'm working to stimulate your growth. I'm working to make you better Christians and stronger Christians. I'm working to help you get through the trials and the darkness and the uncertainty of life and come out on the other side stronger for having gone through it. Yes. Yeah. But notice whereunto I also labor striving according to his working which worketh in me mightily. You see for this ministry will never have its intended effect without God working with me. Without me being able to strive according to his working which worketh in me mightily. This is that effectual working of his power so that my ministry can accomplish something. Because as Paul said, and I read earlier, no man is sufficient of himself for this work. The resources come from God. I have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of me. And it does not matter I want you to look at second at Zechariah 4 6 and let's put what Mark Roma said into a context here. It doesn't matter how pleasant I am or look. But what would he write now? If but what would you write? You wouldn't write what he wrote, buddy, if you were writing about me as a speaker. <laughs> Withered up old prune with a gray beard. That makes him look older. It doesn't matter how pleasant the appearance. It doesn't matter what the personal charisma is. It does not matter what the eloquence is. That's not what's getting the job done. I read in Zechariah 4, 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. This work is accomplished by the effectual working of the power of God. Because in and of myself, I'm just a poor, needy, weak sinner, no different than any other sinner in this room. And I know that. I know that. And if I ever begin to think that, you know, I'm a pretty good guy doing a pretty good job, all God has to do, and believe you me, He does it, is take that hand and just pull it back a little bit and let the stench of my corruptions come to the surface in my thoughts and imaginations and it has me on my face. Oh, wretched man that I am. That's all it takes. And believe you me, He does it. And then I wonder, that ever I was made a man of God. No wonder the Lord Jesus, when he sent the disciples out 
with the Great Commission to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. He prefaced it with this, all powers given unto me in heaven and in earth go ye therefore. We can't go and do this if that power is not with us. Mark says the Lord was working with them. And then look at this passage. I'm just about done. In 2 Corinthians 10, thank God I could finish this and include that, that reading from Mark. I thought you'd be blessed by that. I thought you'd be blessed by hearing from your Uncle Mark. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I only regret that Jennifer's not here to have heard it. Make sure she listens to it. I at least caught two fish out of that room of pond. I caught two, and happy I am. I reeled them in. And they're still here. And I got one out of the, I got one of the grandsons too. I managed to fish him out. Thank God. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, I wouldn't take anything. <laughs> I wouldn't take anything for it. I got, I fished three out of the Arsinski pond. <laughs> Two daughters in law too. <laughs> Reeled them right in. <laughs> and I hope you're still hooked. <laughs> Oh me, 2 Corinthians 10. No, I got two boys too. I got five out of the Arsinski pond. Yeah, thank you. See, I told you, number's not my strong suit. Number's not my strong suit. I can't even, I can't even count to five. Yeah. yeah, oh, I just haven't reeled in the whole gang. <laughs> just about. Yes, 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 and oh, how blessed I am. Oh, how blessed I am. To have done that. 2 Corinthians 10.3 For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God. See where the power is coming from, folks? To the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Some people would take great exception to what I'm going to say, and right now in my pathos, I do not care. It is my job to get into your head and to take this and stuff it into your head so that your thoughts are taken captive, not for me, but for Christ. If it sounds like my job is a form of mind control, it is. And I just read the verse to prove it. Not for me, but for Christ. It's the biggest battle we all have to get these imaginations and these minds disciplined into the channel in which they ought to go. And this is why when I listened again, and I almost tremble when I hear it, Elder Roger's prayer at my ordination, repeatedly, he prayed for the power of God to be given me. He said, when he stands in that pulpit and feels so naked, fill him with thy power. He prayed with such fervency that I just melted at the end of it when the hands were laid on me. You see, you see, the effectual preaching of the gospel is an encounter with the power of God for you and for me. Hearkening back to what Mark wrote in that paper, that you sense you're closer to God. That's what it's all about. An encounter with the power of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. This is the only reason I'm still hacking away at it. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... As we have received mercy, and mercy's God giving you compassion, the only way this ministry has succeeded is because God has had compassion upon my feeble efforts, my pitiful efforts. He has looked upon what I have endeavored to do with pity and said, well, I'll toss some power his way and help him out. As we have received mercy, we faint not. Fifty years, I'm still at it. As Barbara Streisand said in her comeback concert, I'm still here. 
Having received mercy, we faint not. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. I'm not trying to trick you people or trap you people into something that's wrong or just for my own personal wealth and aggrandizement. I mean, I went to Las Vegas, and here were these people with these jobs. I mean, making big money. I mean, if I had compromised on that casino issue, I would have been on easy street. They were generous as it was. I would have inflated the size of the numbers. I would have gotten far more money. I mean, if I was in it in for the money, I sure was stupid. <laughs> really? Seriously? You're walking down memory lane with me, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. We came to our church and raised up money to help them because they would quit their jobs. Really? We did as God is my witness. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, just putting it out here, folks, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. My job, tell you the truth. Lay it on you. Now it's on your conscience between your, you and your God. Now what will you do with it?